Hey, welcome back, folks. Um, time to talk a little bit about anomy and strain theories. This is where we're transitioning into um, kind of the meat and potatoes of uh, deviants, and, and we're going to start tackling some important theories. In this section, uh, we're going to be focusing on the likes of Emil Durkheim and um, uh, Merton and um, oh, a little bit of Edwin Sutherland and uh, Cloward and Olin and yeah we're gonna see what these theorists uh, that generally get lumped into uh, functionalist perspectives have to say about how societies deal with deviants, how societies create deviants and structure deviants. So, um, yeah, let's get going. So, a definition of anomie. Well, the book states that anomie is a state of normlessness where society fails to effectively regulate the expectations or behaviors of its members. Um, we can also look at dictionary.com which uh, talks about it as a state or condition of individuals or society characterized by breakdown or absence of social norms and values. Uh, essentially uprooted people, uh, disorganized people, if you will, in many respects. And this type of social unease, this social unrest, this normlessness certainly has consequences within society. Uh, some of the assumptions of anomie and strain theories. Um, one of the important things is this is a macro level uh, perspective. It's looking at social structures and patterns that emerge in response to conditions individual or groups have little control over. So this is the structure of society. This is the big stuff, folks. This is not individual behavior per se, this is um, structural chances versus um, structural roadblocks, if you will. Um, we're looking at, of course, how structures of society constrain behavior and cause deviance. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this is a macro level view of social behavior. Um, uh, some things about social order, this is a product of cohesive sets of norms. At least that's what the functionalists think. And norms are shared by society and its members. And the response to deviance is to maintain order. So if you have social protesters who are out um, uh, pushing against the, the wall that is those social norms, um, it's not surprising to have police officers who represent uh, order in society coming out and meeting them and drawing lines um, and pushing back. Emil Durkheim, as you'll find in one of the videos in uh, section four, uh, he's an important character and this is one of the biggies in uh, the field of sociology. I think the book said some mistake him as uh, the, or some think of him as the the father of sociology. I've always heard that 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 was Auguste Comte, but Durkheim's in. Uh, he's a biggie. He's he's certainly one of the big three in our discipline. Marx, Weber, Durkheim, um, and 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 this is where he really hit a home run. So Durkheim is ultimately challenging the traditional idea of suicide. He's looking at suicide. He's challenging the traditional idea as an individual or a personal act. Now, it's not like Emil Durkheim doesn't understand that a person is committing suicide, but if we only look at the individual, we miss the structural um, uh, constraints or um, the structural uh, the structures of society that might have created 
the opportunities for this person to commit suicide. Um, he introduces the idea of social influences on social rate or on suicidal rates. And he was very interested in how they varied by country and by community. Um, some of his most important concepts like Gemeinschaft and Gesellschaft, uh, Gemeinschaft meaning um, that, that industrial world, that uh, new type of city that he was watching take shape in the creation of industrialism and capitalism. And, and or Gemeinschaft is um, actually Gemeinschaft is the community. It's the old, uh, the old ways, if you will, um, that were more communally bound. And then Gesellschaft is uh, that urban environment where a lot of people were leaving the hinterlands, the farmlands and moving into the city. And with those types of shifts um, came higher rates of suicide. So um, where capitalism had formed and taken shape for a good long time, you would find more rates of suicide and not just larger numbers because there were more people, um, but uh, higher levels of suicide uh, per capita. And, and these were very unlikely in small communities. He argues that regulation of society and social integra or integration and social change were key factors to this increase in suicide rates. So as you moved into these urban areas and you were less influenced by the, um, the really tight social communities uh, that you lived in prior, um, and let's say you weren't successful, you, you got to the city, couldn't find a job, um, there was nobody that was going to give you any food, there was nobody that was going to help you out, or very few people were going to help you out, unlike the communities that you left before. And this ultimately leads to higher suicide rates. Um, Durkheim's also talking about the idea of a collective order which regulates the fulfillment of needs and desires and how better functioning societies have restraints on ambition for the better of social order. So um, uh, societies whose social goals for individuals uh, marry up to what those individuals can accomplish within the social order tend to have less suicide than those that don't marry. Uh, this is, uh, you know, one of Durkheim's major contributions to sociology um, is, is anomie. And uh, he's suggesting this state of anomie or normlessness re results from a breakdown in the regulation of goals. Um, he also suggests deviance as a result of the lack of regulation of goals and unlimited desires and needs. No living being can be happy or even exist unless his needs are sufficiently proportioned to his means. So um, you'll have uh, the opportunity to watch a video, this section on uh, Crips and Bloods made in America. And what I want you to think about is, um, you know, how are these individuals measuring up to what society says that they can attain, and if they're running into roadblocks, how are they solving them? What does um, getting into gangs have to do with um, reestablishing what social norms are for these individual group members, gang members, if you will? Uh, Merton. As, as we find with many of these social theorists, they're really standing on the, the, the shoulders of the theorists that came before them. And Merton is really taking Durkheim's theories and he's adapting them um, to the settings that he's looking at in the 1930s in the United States. And he comes out and creates what is now known as strain theory. 
Um, Merton is a, a son of an immigrant, uh, born into the Philadelphia slums, um, and ultimately sheds those cultural characteristics that um, uh, defined his immigrant status, became Robert Merton, um, and, and becomes a respected PhD uh, at Harvard and, and, and really uh, maps out one of the more important theoretical perspectives um, explaining deviance in society. He's talking about the interplay of needs, desires, and processes of cultural socialization. Um, and anomie results from strained differences in cultural goals and legitimate means. Uh, he's, he's very um, aware of the fact that not all have the same opportunities for success, but we all desire success. So um, there's this American dream out there that we all want to attain, but not all of us are going to actually have um, the opportunity to do that because of uh, structural constraints that are preventing some people, uh, people of color, um, people of certain ethnic backgrounds. Uh, of course, women are all going to have uh, more uh, impediments in their way, more structural impediments in their way at uh, attaining this uh, level of success, this American dream than uh, the dominant in society, which is the white male. Um, Mer Merton maps out a deviance typology where he talks about uh, cultural goals and how they measure up with institutionalized means. These concepts are conformity, innovation, ritualism, retreatism, and and then ultimately rebellion conformity uh, is the acceptance of cultural goals uh, for success and wealth legitimate means to achieve them uh, you go to college you go out into the work world you have a couple of babies um, uh, you work your whole life and and then you retire that that's that's conformity or you have the innovators which um, they're accepting the cultural goals for success and wealth but they're choosing illegitimate means to achieve them. This, of course, includes drug dealers, uh, thieves, embezzlers, robbers, anyone that is stepping outside of the cultural norms to make their success. The ritualists are abandoning goals for success and wealth, um, but they're still using the legit means to make a living. Um, employees below management, who will never strive for management positions are an example of these types of folks. They're just there uh, going through the, uh, the daily rigmarole and collecting a paycheck. Uh, and then you've got the retreatists, which are abandoning the goals for success and wealth, and they're using a little illegitimate means to make a living. Um, this includes People like serious drug addicts, the chronically homeless. And then there's the rebellionists that don't play by the rules at all. They reject the cultural goals of success, uh, wealth attainment, and replace it with another primary goal, either legitimate or illegitimate means to achieve those goals. They, they're considered political deviants, and they're usually talking about um, changing the social order, uh, you know, creating havoc, and then uh, recreating a new social order.